Hey guys, how's it going? So today we're gonna to plant some things out in the cut flower garden. Edibles, actually. We've got some cabbage, we've got walla walla onions, and we've got two grapevines. I also wanna give you an update on the honeyberries that we wintered over in containers out here. In fact, there's one of them right there. And I picked up two carriage lights for the cut flower shed, so we're gonna unbox one of them at least one of them, and hold it up and see if we like it. Let's start with these honeyberries quick. So these are the two we planted in these exact pots and moved out here last spring. And this is where they sat all winter long, completely exposed. They are a zone three through seven, so very winter hardy, thankfully. Look at all the new growth. I mean, just absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. So this one is a honey bunch variety and this one is sugar pie. I was really happy with how these performed last year. I mean, they got full sun all day, which I think is what they prefer. They are part of the honeysuckle family. And at maturity, I think, depending on the variety, I know one of the varieties in this particular line, you can get like over seven pounds of fruit from a mature size honeyberry plant, which that's a lot. <laughs> and the berries aren't massive. So that's a lot of berries. So given the fact that we got quite a bit last year off of them and they look so good again this spring, I think we'll have another good year with them. And I think I'm just gonna leave them in these pots. That's why I'm going to add some compost and nutrients back into the soil, just to kind of charge it back up again. And with the other two that I picked up, I might just repeat the same kind of look here because they did so well just sitting out here. I've got to put tough stuff out here um, if I expect it to winter over. So maybe I can do a couple more pots and put them at the end of these rows and kind of create a little bit of balance that way. I think that might look nice. Okay, so I actually have some leftover I think this is rose tone. <laughs> uh, the bag broke open the other day and so I have this bucket. So I'm going to use a little bit of that in these containers and then top them up with the land and sea compost. And there we have it. Super easy little chore to get done there. Give them a little recharge as they are starting to put on new growth and starting to bloom. And we'll go through and water later. I'm gonna water everything out here later on this afternoon. So we'll water it all in. And then once we run our drip, which originates over here. So we run a water supply line along this side of this kind of quadrant of the flower garden. And then we tee off of that to run our drip tape this way. But once it gets to the end here, you can see where the coupler is. This will just pop right into the drip line. And then this is what waters them throughout the summer. And there's the second one. I think they look really nice and ready to go for the season. I tucked their tags in the side here. I'm going to make them nicer looking tags to pop down in so we don't forget which variety is which. But wouldn't it look pretty to pot the other two in the same kind of pots and put them at the other end? Just kind of like the cap of that row. I don't know. We'll just see what happens with that. Now here are the lights that we picked up for the flower shed. I don't know. They look black on the box with like maybe some bronze. I want them to be black. So that's going to be the first thing. It didn't, it says it's an iron finish. I don't know what that means. What does this mean? And we picked these up at Home Depot yesterday. I think they were $79 a piece. But you guys, I found lights that I absolutely love online, but they were like $700 a piece. There's no way. There's no way I'm spending $700, $1,400 for two carriage lights for this shed. Nope. So I'm hoping that these work out. They're pretty lights, I think. One on either side of the door. It'll be nice to have some light out here. You can see we're still in construction here. Siding is done all the way around. Uh, the door has been put in. We do need to have it painted, but they've been working on the inside. So we've got the ceiling all taped. They're gonna get that done and then we can have the electricians back out to hang the chandelier and put the uh, can lights in. But you can see the tongue and groove here, which I don't know. I might, I was gonna have it painted, but I'm not sure what we're gonna do here. I love looking out though and seeing the orchard and seeing some color out there from the bulbs. It's gonna be so much fun. And then as far as the tongue and groove goes, I was initially planning on painting it a fairly light color because that makes it better for filming and photography, honestly. Um, it helps, you know, bounce some light. But it's so bright in here as it is. Like there's no artificial lighting in here yet. And once we get can lights put in and we have the chandelier in here and all the natural light coming in, it may not be as necessary for me to go really light, which is kind of against the grain for me. I like dark moody colors. Not that I would go dark in here, but anyway, all that said, I think I'm just gonna wait on the inside to kind of see once everything's kind of been finished up, that'll probably be the last step. Let's get one of these lights out. 
Hey, what's up? Hey, hey, uh, do you want to come out here and hold up one of these lights on the cut flower shed so we can see what it looks like? Sure. Okay, it might be a little bit too nautical. I don't know. What's that? It looks a little bit nautical to me. And nautical? I'll, yeah. Doesn't that look nautical? Like it's a lantern, like ocean style? I don't know. Can you come out here? <laughs> we'll, sure. we'll decide. Okay, so I didn't think it until I got it out of the box, but it does look kind of nautical. That's not really what I'm going for. <laughs> you drove the truck out here? <laughs> you know what? When the other gator's in the shop? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I see you driving a vehicle out here. Well, only if I have it full of supplies. Okay, doesn't that look nautical, kind of? No. Are you sure? No. I mean, to me, it just doesn't really matter. It's like, <laughs> this isn't something that my eye is drawn to either way. Sure. Can you like, hold it up again? You know what it is? I mean, I like it, but like, okay, if you bring it down so we can take a look, this right here, like the lines of it reminds me of like a diving suit. A diving suit? Like an old timey diving suit. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No, it doesn't? An old timey diving suit. Hold on, let me Google an image. Okay. Doesn't that remind you of it oh. at all? Kinda. Does it look steampunk to you? Oh, Google, it... Google steampunk. Steampunk light? No, not steampunk, just, just steampunk. Just steampunk? Okay. That's showing a lot of attire. It looks nautical to me. Okay. Well. Hold on, let me let me just Google nautical light, just <laughs> for fun. So these are some of the nautical light fixtures. They have like those little cages around them. Yeah, I don't think that looks at all nautical. You know what I think you should do? I think you should just put them up, and after a while, if you can't stand them, then give them away or sell them on a garage sale. But I could return them. I mean, they were still 80 bucks a piece. Yeah. I could still return well, what's them. What's wrong with them? Well, they look a little nautical. What's wrong with nautical? Well, maybe maybe I love it. Do... Maybe this looks like nautical too. Well, it doesn't look nautical. That's siding. Yeah, it looks like a beach house. No, it does not. How does that look like a beach house? Every beach house has siding like Every this. house has siding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you guys, you guys need to weigh in on these light fixtures. Let us know what you think. We'll hang on to them until I get the general consensus from you. I mean, I like the color. They said it was a uh, charred iron. Like oh. that's the word. I mean, now that they're out, I see yeah. what they mean. But I wish they would say like they're on the. It's on the black side of things. Yeah. You know. I think they look fine. Uh, I did look great. I think it's this part, like lighthouse lanternish, and then this line right here. It, I was trying to find ones that looked like the Williamsburg, like the colonial um, lights that I found online that were $700 a piece. Oh, yeah. And this was actually not that close, <laughs> but closer than a lot a of those. the price. I know. That's the thing. I just don't want it to look too, like, old, like 290s. You know what I mean? And that's what a lot of the lights look like to me. I'm going to FaceTime my sister in an effort to get a hold of my mom, who somehow disabled FaceTime on her phone. What's up? What's up? <laughs> oh, hey, hon. Hey. Okay, so I bought a light fixture and I need to know what style you think it looks like. Because <laughs> now that I have it out, I just don't know. I, it looks too much like something to me. Okay. Hold on. Let me. Okay. Am I pointing the phone right? Yeah. What does that look like to you? Like a lighthouse lantern. Yes. It looks nautical, doesn't it? Yeah, yep, got, got to take them back. All right, well, back to the drawing board on those carriage lights. We're going to go plant some grapes now. Oh, let's stop real quick because I wanted to show you we're starting to see some color on these dafts. Even a couple of blooms on this side. Look. Oh, it makes me so happy to see some blooms. Oh. So here we are, you can see the blackberry bed is the furthest bed this way, and then this is our heritage raspberry bed. And the grapevine structure spans the width from the outside of this bed to the outside of that bed. It's roughly 30 feet. So roughly 30 feet from this side to this side, these vertical posts are six feet tall. And then we ran some heavy duty metal cable here and here. We may lower this one or we may add a third in between and we're just going to have to see how it goes. And here are the grapevines that we have today. Just two. We have space to plant four 
but look at the roots on these. Isn't that just amazing? Both of these are a variety called Suffolk Red. So they're a red seedless grape, medium in size, really sweet, wonderful flavor. It's a variety that my parents have been selling down at the garden center for a lot of years, and it's actually the only variety they were able to get in stock this year. It's been a little hit and miss with edibles in particular the last few years. I think there's been a big push for edible gardening, which is wonderful. Uh, so we're just gonna be planting two right now, and then we will save spots for the other two whenever we can get them. And I haven't even really decided what variety I'm after for those other two. We don't do any juice or preserving uh, with grapes. They're just for fresh eating. So they won't be like Concords, I don't think, um, unless I decide to venture into that realm. Uh, but we just like to have fresh grapes for eating. So the plan is to plant one between each one of these posts, and then it can grow this way and this way and they will be roughly seven and a half feet apart. Recommended spacing on grapevines, you'll kind of find all over the board, but generally you'll see it between six and 12 feet would be the recommended spacing. And it will depend on variety and it will also depend on your climate uh, and what your soil's like. The better the soil, if the grapes really love it, you'll probably want to space them a little bit further. For tougher soils, a little bit closer together is usually okay. We have pretty hard pan soil out here and very high pH. So I think they'll do fine at about seven and a half foot spacing. And I do plan on pruning them pretty hard. You can see the soil's kind of roughed up because I initially had thought I was going to plant them right on this post and right on this post and maybe just do two vines, but I think I would really like to try doing the four. I brought out the auger. This is a nine inch size and I intend on digging maybe two or three holes right in the same spot so we create a nice fluffy planting bed for our grapes. And then we'll add in some starter fertilizer and our compost. So let's get the holes dug and then I'll show you the vines going in. All right, so let's take a closer look at these roots. It's a beautiful root system, and I think this hole will be perfect. I did two holes with the auger. That way we can spread the roots out nice and even, but you can see the first root comes out right here, so we will be burying the uh, stalk right here, right above that first root. Okay, so here's native soil. You can go a little deeper. There's that first root. So you can barely see them, but they are both planted. Here we go. And once it reaches this height, we'll start training them a little bit harder. And then there's the second one right here. And then we will have our two reserved spots right here and here. And it's possible, depending on how it goes, we may extend the grape structure further down. But now I need to run some drip to these before I move on to our next planting project. So I'm going to tap in to the half inch supply line that's feeding these berry beds, and I'm gonna bring a line over to feed the grapevines. Okay, I've got my supplies here, a trenching shovel. This is the half inch supply line that I'll be using. That's half inch centennial drip tubing is what it says on it. I've got my clippers, clamping tool for these right here, which helps uh, secure our couplers because when I dig down here, I'll dig down and find the supply line to the raspberry bed. We will cut it and put this coupler in uh, so that we can take off in this direction with this line. This is an ender right here. So when we end the line, I'll use that and then some landscape staples to tack it down. Okay, so I'm just gonna start digging. Okay, it's all done. Before I fill this trench back in, I just wanted to show you closer up what I did. This is the original supply line to the raspberries. So it runs this direction and then right in here is where it tees off and goes up into the bed. And then it does that for the other two beds that way. 
So I cut it right here so that I could put in a T-coupler and take off this direction. And we use the half inch clamps right here to hold the couplers on. And then I just tacked the line down with landscape staples every few feet and then came up out of the trench right here. And we're going back behind the grapevines. So you can see it just tacked down right here. We will cover over that with wood chips or mulch. And then I went ahead and ran it all the way down since it's not going to be using water until we tap into it with emitters. I do plan on putting grapes here, so it'll be nice to have the line already run. And then this is the end right here. I use the figure eight ender there. Now, here's all of our quarter inch supplies right here. I'm gonna pop two one gallon per hour emitters, one on either side of each of the grapevines root balls. So we need four. My punching tool. So the goal here is to have a one gallon per hour emitter right here and a one gallon per hour emitter right here. Thus we get even water coverage. Karen was just telling me that this tool might be broken. We're gonna try it. Oh, nope. And we insert this pointy side in to the supply line, like that. So see how this punching tool works? You put your tube in there and then it punches your hole because sometimes it can be really hard to punch these in just by hand. Done. So this right here is perfect. And if you can't get your half inch supply line up close enough to your plant, you can always go in with quarter inch tubing and come off your half inch supply line and run it to your plant. You just wanna be mindful about how far away you're running that quarter inch line because I think the recommended, and it's gonna be different for everyone depending on your water flow and pressure and all those things, but um, typically you don't wanna run it over 20 to 25 feet. Hopefully you can get your supply line closer to your plants than that. Okay, I just need to fill this back in and then we can move on to the next planting project. Before we leave this area, I have to show you how these raspberries are doing. Oh my goodness, are they ever filling in. And these canes, some of them look like they're dead, but they're not. The buds are coming, they're just a little slower, like this one's super fast. And these are a little bit slower, then we've got a couple of fast ones. I don't know, either way, we have an incredibly full bed of raspberries. Let me walk down this direction. These are the ones we mowed down. But look at all the starts coming up. And I do have people coming this afternoon to dig all of these starts up and take them home. I contemplated burying some of that like bamboo shield. It's just like a heavy duty, I don't know if it's plastic that you put under the ground and it's just a root shield. <laughs> like it keeps your plants corralled. And I'm considering doing that because this is gonna be a perpetual thing, I think, the raspberries coming out. They're fairly easy to pull. You need to have good gloves on to do it. Um, or if you've got people who want to come dig them, I mean, free plants. And the fall golds, which just is amazing, they're also kind of suckering out. I'm going to dig those out and plant them right in the bed here. And they're also filling in. Beautiful. We've got some weeds too. Okay, let's move to our next area. Whew. Some of my fabric has come loose. So this is where I recently planted the ranunculus and anemones and they're actually doing really well. I have this side open because it was actually getting too hot under there. But all of the ones that weren't really showing a lot of growth are showing quite a bit of growth. Samantha pulled all of these tags up. So I have no idea where one of these varieties starts and where it stops. So we're gonna have to wait until they start to bloom. And then the ones, look at all the growth here. The ones down here, this is why I started putting the, the uh, side up because they were kind of starting to yellow. Like they were getting a little bit stressed because it was so darn hot underneath uh, the cover. The reason that I put the cover on was mainly, mainly because of our wind. I wanted to protect the poor plants. I could probably take these covers off at this point. But when I planted these rows, I went ahead and amended this whole entire row. So there's compost and biotone already here uh, just because I was in the process of doing it. So I figured, I just go ahead with it. Anyway, I think I'm gonna come in with onions right here since it's ready to go. And this is the only quadrant we have drip run to. The other ones don't have it yet. And the reason for that is we forgot to order more drip tape. So it won't be here till next week. And honestly, like I could plant the cabbage like I did last year. I had it lining. In fact, let me show you, it was really cute. I had it lining this pathway right here. It was before construction even started on the cut flower shed. I've just always loved the look of cabbage. But if I planted it there today, then I would be hand watering it for at least 
least a week, probably longer, because it's likely when the drip tape arrives, we won't be ready to just run out here and run the drip tape. And it's nice to run drip tape when you don't have anything already planted. Um, to not have anything in the way is nice. So I think what we'll do is go ahead and amend this row and plant our cabbage there this year. It's good to change it up every year anyway. So again, for our onions here, we have Walla Wallas. There's a whole bunch right here probably not going to be planting as many as last year because I still have quite a number in storage but we separate all of these we separate them all and they're each one individual plant and they'll each become a nice big onion and then I think we've got a couple different kinds of cabbage this one's called tiara which says it's a medium-sized green heads that are extra thin and tender mature early so it's a 65 day let me double check I thought I had more than one variety oh yeah, Crystal Vantage. This one is a rapidly maturing small cord green cabbage with incredibly sweet flavor and crunch, resistant to bolting, 65 day. So we've got a whole flat of these that we'll be planting out. So we'll plant them out. I'm gonna water them in by hand with a hose today. And then after that, the drip will just take off and do the job for us, which is awesome. Also, before we plant, I do have some plants that came back, which is so exciting. I'm just gonna leave them and see what happens. We've got two part rows of Larkspur, and then we've got one row of what looks to be part Larkspur, part Orlea, white finch Orlea. And then I've got a couple of pincushion flowers that need, need water and grooming. But I think these are Fama pincushion flowers, the white ones. I'll take it. Anything that wants to come back in this space can have at it. onions are in we ended up with just a tiny bit of space at the end of the row which is kind of perfect because I'm gonna have some extra red cabbage here pretty soon and I'll just pop them right at the end there uh, but I think between this row and what we have up in the raised bed garden we've got close to 250 Walla Wallas planted thus far which is quite a lot we use a lot of onions but we also give a lot of onions away and I did mention earlier that we do have quite a number in storage still and they have stored so well and I just gave some to a friend the other day um, and we've been using using them like crazy. So it's been really, really nice. I do plan on planting some candy onions as well. And I did flip dirt in my face at one point and I forgot to check. <laughs> I'm probably super dirty, oh well. Okay, so I think we'll just go in with cabbage in this row. We need to go grab some compost, bud. You wanna come with me on the gator? All right. All done. And we've got some space right here, the cabbage end, maybe about two thirds of the way is how far they made it. So onions, especially like with the Walla Walla types that get really nice and big, we try to space about four to six inches apart, which works perfectly because our emitter holes are every six inches. And I try to make sure that a root ball or the root balls end up right next to an emitter. So you can see like right here, there's an emitter, there's my plant, there's the emitter, there's the plant, same on this side. And then since I've got two rows running, the water soaks in enough to do a row right down the middle. And I kind of try to zigzag with them so that I kind of optimize the spacing. So we've got three rows of onions here. And then with our cabbage, this is the Crystal Vantage variety that requires 30 inch spacing. So they get a lot bigger than the other variety, which is called Tiara. 
and these require 15 inch spacing. When I started to plant this variety, I was going every 12 inches because I was trying to line the root ball up with an emitter. And I stood up and I was already halfway done planting. And I just thought those are way too close together. What am I thinking? So I ended up popping a whole bunch of them out and replanting them 18 inches. So every third emitter. And they look a lot better. I think they'll be a lot happier, less crowded. So while I think it's important to put the plant right up next to an emitter, especially in the beginning, because they need that moisture, especially cabbage, they want to be consistently moist all the time and have a root, a cool root system. Um, but once those plants get a little, little bit bigger, those roots are spreading out and they're utilizing that water that's dripping even in between the plants. Um, so I find that for our purposes, because we have so many zones to run, um, that doing the six inch emitter spacing just soaks the area much quicker and much better. And we do not have to run those zones as long. So everything got compost and starter fertilizer today. That's probably all the cabbage we'll get. It's a short season crop, 65 day. Um, I might come along midway and give it fertilizer, probably not. And then the onions though, all all alliums in general, garlic and onions, they want to be fed a lot. They're heavy feeders. So I'll probably come along with garden tone once, maybe twice before the end of their season, which is much longer. I think it's 110 or 120 day, day crop. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was helpful. And I cannot wait to give you guys updates as the season progresses out here. It's just going to be a mishmash of vegetables and flowers all together in the same space. Uh, the next crop we're going to be working on in here, well the next crops are potatoes and then some cold season flowers. So we're going to get those seeded. Um, I think it was about this time last year that I was seeding flowers out here. I can't remember exactly but feels feels like the right time. Anyway, see you guys in the next video. <laughs> Bye.